What has been described as the most significant achievement of John Paul II's pontificate is the promulgation of a new catechism of the Catholic Church. Conservatives have welcomed it. Liberals have been silent or even concerned. What does it really say? How should we look upon it? I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today to discuss the new catechism. Uh, first is Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Parma, Ohio, and Father Clarence Kelly, spiritual director of the Daughters of Mary, uh, Mother of Our Savior, a congregation of traditional Catholic sisters in Round Top, New York. Uh, Reverend Fathers, what, uh, why would there be motivation or why would there be a new catechism? My understanding is the last catechism of the church, official catechism, was produced by the Council of Trent in the 16th century in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation. Why do we need a new one? I think that it is the final step in the reform uh, of everything Catholic, as it were. They began with the reform of the ordination rites, uh, and uh, they end with the catechism. It was just about the last thing that had not been uh, reformed in the spirit of Vatican II. Uh, up to this time, we used the Roman catechism or the catechism of the Council of Trent, which is a masterpiece of uh, Catholic teaching. And it's the final step. It's the last uh, nail in the coffin, one might say. Father Jenkins, we see in, uh, in the reception of the catechism that it's widely acknowledged or regarded to be an affirmation of tradition. Uh, some of the teachings there certainly <coughs> riled uh, many people in the world, many liberal Catholics, like the affirmation of condemnation of abortion, the restriction of the priesthood solely for men. Uh, we could go on and on. I was actually struck that it asserted things which one normally would think they would be embarrassed to admit that countries have guardian angels. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, do you think there's anything there that might be uh, more in the spirit of Vatican II, something which is ambiguous or actually non-Catholic? Well, Julius, actually this is a perfect catechism for Vatican II. It is supposed to be the catechetical equivalent of Vatican Council II. And that it is because it, it functions just as Vatican II did. It gives with one hand and takes away with the other. And so uh, the liberals and the conservatives can both mine it for what they want to, to push. The, um, well, even the letter of introduction that John Paul II wrote is an example of that because he says in that letter of introduction, and I can, uh, I can quote some of that for you, that uh, he is invoking his apostolic authority to publish this. He says, the catechism of the Catholic Church, which I approved June 25th last, and the publication of which I today order by virtue of my apostolic authority, is a statement of the Church's faith and of Catholic doctrine attested to or illumined by sacred scripture the apostolic tradition, and the church's magisterium. And having said this, that he was ordering it published by virtue of his apostolic authority, he goes on to say that this catechism is not intended to replace the local catechisms duly approved by the ecclesiastical authorities, diocesan bishops, and the Episcopal conferences, especially if they have been approved by the apostolic see. It is meant to encourage and assist in the writing of new local catechisms. So in other words, the, uh, what he's promulgating here, if we can use the word, um, was not meant to replace the, uh, the local catechisms that have been produced by the bishops that have brought in so much heterodoxy and, and in some cases just downright heresy. So again, it's the pick and choose kind of thing. This is what you find in the new code of canon law where uh, the new code lays down how the, the sacraments of the conciliar church are to be employed, but then each time uh, the code ends by saying, these norms are to be followed except where the local bishop's conference deems it, deems it advisable to do otherwise. So it really is, at least implicitly, an attack on the central authority, the very, very nature of apostolic authority in the church. What I, the, one of the senses I received when I was perusing the, uh, the catechism was when they <coughs> deal with the whole question of papal authority, they again go back to the Vatican II idea of the Pope in union with the bishops. The Pope in union with the bishops. Uh, 
they may say that the bishops have you know no power if they're not in union with the pope but this kind of leveling is contrasted i believe to the traditional doctrine where it says the pope has supreme power if every bishop in the world disagrees with him that's too bad the pope's authority is supreme and perhaps in this letter of promulgation we are seeing this concept acted out where you can use the other one if you've already been using it I don't think it's a question of, of, of that, actually, Julius. I think rather it's a question of what Father Jenkins said, that here is, uh, you know, something for everybody in a certain sense, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the Catholic people who are very distressed and upset with what has happened in the church have now something to cling to, and the modernists and the liberals can, let's say, maybe smirk a little because there are a lot of things in the catechism which are actually good. But, but they can say, well, it's very clear from the letter of promulgation, so-called, <clears throat> that John Paul II doesn't really mean for us to be bound by this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's actually incredible. Uh, when the catechism of the Council of Trent, which is the Roman catechism that this replaces, was put forward, it was, priests were told throughout the world, you use this catechism. This is a catechism of the faith that you're supposed to use. You're supposed to even preach your sermons from this catechism. It says more than that. Again, in, in reviewing that document, we saw that it says, the pastor should explain to the faithful this. This is how it should be explained. He should take care not to stress too much this and whatever. It gives explicit instructions of what the pastor is supposed to do. Right. It, it, it even gives uh, uh, outline for uh, sermons to be preached throughout the course of of the whole year. But again, that, the difference is the, the, the way the Catholic Church uh, teaches versus the spirit of the new church. The spirit of the new church is a liberal spirit, an ecumenical spirit. It's a spirit which uh, deviates from the notion of, uh, of truth to a very good extent and also from the unique and exclusive character of the Catholic Church. It, it's, it's a little bit of something for everybody and that's what this is. And as I said to you before, you know, actually when I started to read this, I was actually surprised to find that th there were so many things in this catechism which were right on target, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, and the catechism actually says that the existence of God can be proved by the light of reason alone, and it quotes the First Vatican Council, which is anathema to the modernists, because the modernists deny that human reason can attain the knowledge of God uh, by its own light. Uh, uh, but again, they don't have to worry, you see. The modernists don't have to worry. They can say, well, that's, you know, a, a little concession, as it were, to the conservatives, but we're not bound by it because it's very clear from the language of the letter of promulgation that we don't have to follow this catechism. Here's a question that, that, that I think is very puzzling. Uh, on the one hand, you have something which is promulgated, which, as Father Kelly says, has very many orthodox things. But on the other hand, there's a tremendous dichotomy from what is in this document to what is consistently taught in pontifical universities, in seminaries, on the local parish level, what people who are considered to be Catholics and theologians good, good standing, such as ex-Father McGuire of Marquette teach. They're not excommunicated. What, how, how does one bring sense out of this condition? Well, it's very difficult to bring sense out of it because uh, it is a contradiction. Um, for example, in this catechism, as I mentioned, it gives with one hand what it takes away from with another. Uh, I found it quite striking, too, Father Kelly, that there were references to the Council of Trent and even citations, like these citations from the to Council Saint of Trent. St. Augustine and to St. Thomas uh, Aquinas. Mm -hmm. Bernard of Clairvaux. Mm -hmm. and but then after, after citing all of these authorities, uh, let's say in particular about the real presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, right. and even using uh, the words of the Council of Trent saying that there's a substantial change, that the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ are made substantially present, and using the word transubstantiation, they then revert back to Vatican II mode and uh, say that this Blessed Sacrament can be given to people who don't believe the Catholic faith as though the faith or any given doctrine of it is something negotiable or inconsequential. Right. Uh, this is something the church has always condemned. So they, they approve in practice what the church has always condemned while actually blowing a few uh, puffs of incense at what the church has taught. Right, but they, they could not very well 
uh, condemn giving Holy Communion to non-Catholics because the Code of Canon Law that was promulgated by mm -hmm. <clears throat> John Paul II specifically and explicitly provides for giving Holy Communion mm -hmm. to non-Catholics and also for non-Catholics to receive Holy Communion in the Catholic Church. So in that sense, the Catechism is uh, is in step with uh, the the re the uh, sure. reform of the Code of Canon. Perfectly Law. faithful to Vatican II. Yeah. This is what it says. In fact, um, ecclesi. Uh, let's see. Is this the point here? He says ecclesial communities derived from the Reformation and separated from the Catholic Church have not preserved the proper reality of the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness, especially because of the absence of the Sacrament of Holy Orders. But then they go on to say, when in the ordinary's judgment a grave necessity arises, Catholic ministers may give the sacraments of Eucharist, penance, and anointing of the sick to other Christians not in full communion with the Catholic Church who ask for them of their own will, provided they give evidence of holding the Catholic faith regarding these sacraments and possess the required dispositions. So as long as someone believed, uh, according to this catechism, in this, the Eucharist, penance, and anointing of the sick, regardless of whatever else he might or might not believe. Even if he didn't believe in the divinity of Christ, for example. Mm. If he didn't believe he was the Son of God. But he was substantially some... present, right. 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 Because and again, it is left up to the judgment of the ordinary, yeah. of the local bishop. Father it's it's a wide open door for uh, Before we, the, the next subject, maybe we can them. get into looking at the, the, the <laughs> document itself, but before we do that, one question I'd like to put forth is, uh, I found in the teaching of John Paul II, say in his encyclical, he might develop an idea of the Incarnation, which states that by virtue of the Incarnation, all men, Christ united all men to himself forever, never be separated from them. And yet, and this is an encyclical, and yet when you look uh, under the Incarnation in the Catechism, it doesn't say that. Or in another case where in the Observatory Romano, John Paul II developed his notion of the descent into hell, meaning essentially that Christ was simply buried in the ground. When you look under that particular article of faith in the Catechism, it doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. How do you explain this dichotomy that the teaching of John Paul II, who is held to be the Pope, is not reflected in the Catechism he promulgates? Mm -hmm. Maybe they fear that there would be too much reaction if uh, what he has taught before would be incorporated bodily into this, into this new catechism. Right, I um, think so. You know, what they're concerned about is, is not so much what's on these pages, but what Catholics will actually do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the, their Vatican II Catholics will actually do. And, you know, they, they might well find that, or think, that it will have no practical impact on the people who are still following the Vatican II Church. Uh -huh. The fact is, when the bottom line is, is there, it sanctions what the Vatican II Church has done as far as, uh, as disordered ecumenism and, and all of the other attacks on the faith. For example, here it says that um, a certain communion in Socrates and so in the Eucharist, given suitable circumstances and the approval of the church authority, is not merely possible but is encouraged, quote-unquote, from... Uh, um, the new code of canon law. Well, communicatio in sacris uh, with those who are not members of the Catholic Church was always considered to be a grave, grave sin, a sin of sacrilege, and it would even make one suspect of being a heretic. Hmm. And they're saying it should be encouraged. You're watching what Catherine Fathers, before, maybe one more question before we get into the document itself. It seems to me that what is stated in the catechism is so far removed from ordinary experience as to not even have any meaning. I mean, the majority of Catholics would, would laugh or would say, this is crazy on a practical level. The, the beliefs that are, 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 are set forth and the standards that are set forth have simply, in the, in the real world, have no meaning. Yeah, I think what they're doing to a great extent, there are probably a, a number of motives for uh, writing the catechism <coughs> this way. <coughs> Excuse me, it may be that people involved, they uh, designated a certain number of conservatives and a certain number of liberals and uh, modernists, okay? And, uh, and that gave a certain direction. You know, it's, it's sort of an ecumenical approach to things. But, but there's a real practical consequence of that. And the practical consequence of that is that it produces a catechism 
which wins a certain degree of respectability among serious-minded people, you know? Uh, I mean, after all, uh, the people who have reformed the vast majority of, of Catholics, who do they seek to reform now? Th they don't have to reform the ones who have already been changed in faith and morals. They have to go after that small percentage, perhaps 10% of, of Catholics who still have the faith. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's, that's a bigger figure than the, the facts warrant, but l let's say if there are 10%, if the figure is 10% of nominal Catholics who still have the Roman Catholic faith, those are the ones that they would be after. And uh, they're having some trouble with a lot of those people now because they've done certain things which have shaken them up. For example, Put them on notice. Right. For, for example, interestingly enough, uh, it's very interesting to me, that from, I guess from a psychological point of view, the approval of altar girls has, has caused a tremendous uh, spirit of dissension among those uh, very people who are most prone to defend, you know, like ecclesiastical authority. In fact, the Latin Mass magazine which is a conservative magazine, a sort of a, a Novus Ordo magazine, which encourages the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, they actually published uh, letters and articles critical of, of uh, John Paul II, which was quite amazing. And I think the, the feeling I get is, is that things like altar girls really set these people off because it's a very practical thing. It's concrete. <clears throat> and, and, it, and it communicates a certain message. So, so I think that the way this catechism is written, it's written in such a way as to appeal to those people and yet at the same time to preserve uh, the integrity of the reform that has taken place. Because in the middle of, let's say you have a table and the table is covered with a lot of appetizers, <clears throat> which are good and delicious as it were, but right in the middle is the main course and inside, is, inside it is cyanide mm -hmm. and it's there inside this catechism. Let's talk about that after we've, we've prepared the way, and perhaps this is the most interesting to that 10% figure which might still cling to the faith. What, is there anything in this catechism that you find objectionable? Well, there are a number of, th of things that are objectionable, yeah. sure. Right. Sure, is what that a tongue-in-cheek question? No, that, that's, that's, that's a challenge. It's like I've laid down the gauntlet. Do you, can you name one thing that you find to be objectionable, something which is not a sure norm of the Catholic faith, something which is a departure from tradition which we are all bound to? Mm -hmm. Well, you look at me, Julius, as though you're not sure. But I, uh, yes, yes, I would say so. For example, you're on page 400 in the English translation because the French, the French edition is actually the, the official a rendition of the Catechism. Um, all translations are made from that. On uh, number 1601, they talk about uh, matrimonial uh, relationship between a husband and wife. And uh, that whole section, 1601, is a citation from the New Code of Canon Law, number 1055. And it talks about, well, I'll just read it, the matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole life is by its nature ordered toward the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. Now, to an ordinary uh, person in the street, this might sound perfectly Wonderful. orthodox. Uh, However, <coughs> it is actually very deadly because implicitly contained in here is the justification for using artificial birth control. And by the, same, uh, by the way, it's the same implicit... Uh, uh, justification for birth control that you'll find even in Humanae Vitae, which the conservative Novus Ordo Catholics tout as being the great uh, document of Paul VI against birth control. And the reason why I say that this, uh, from the new code of canon law and now in the catechism, is an implicit approval of birth control, artificial birth control, is because uh, whereas in the true Catholic Church there was always very, very strictly and explicitly made the distinction uh, between these, these goods of marriage, the good of the spouses, and the procreation of children, and uh, stated that they were in a hierarchy, that the procreation of children is the primary end of marriage, and it can yield to no other of the, of the ends of marriage in its importance. This statement uh, lists the, the uh, good of the spouses first, and the procreation education of offspring second. 
And the reason why this is so lethal is because if you do not say that the procreation of children is primary and the mutual comfort and, and uh, consolation of the spouses is secondary, you can equate the two of them and then where one seems to oppose the other, you can choose one or the other. And so somebody who would say, well, there are two purposes of matrimony, our mutual happiness together or our having children and raising them, but obviously if we have more children, this will put strains on our relationship and our happiness together. Therefore, we can choose our, our relationship over and against children and we can still have our relationship, but prevent having children. And this is what many of these Novus Ordo Catholics are doing. That's why they say 80, 85% of the uh, childbearing age married Novus Ordo Catholics are using artificial birth control. I know Father, Jen uh, Father Kelly wants to interject <coughs> something with me. I just, right. just want to say that even in the order that they list them, mm -hmm. they have reversed the order. Exactly. Even in the order they list. But, <coughs> but to that figure, as I mentioned on a program before, that uh, it's actually 98% uh, of Catholics between 18 mm -hmm. and 29 who believe in artificial contraception. 98%. You mean only two out of every 100 Novus Ordo Catholics? Except the teaching <laughs> of the Catholic Church on artificial contraception. So in other words, it's not that 98% use artificial contraception. 98% yeah. reject the teaching the of teaching the Roman of the Catholic Church, Church on artificial contraception. I mean, for, for you're not talking about the Humanae Vitae, you're talking about Casti Canubi, the document by Pope Pius XI. That's right. In other was words, that a dogmatic statement? It was. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was in a seminary, uh, I was taught by uh, a professor who said that when it came out, when he was in a seminary, they believed it was infallible uh, mm -hmm. statement of Pius XI. Well, Father Jenkins, on a, on a practical level, what we see here is a, 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 a development where this this catechism, as a sense, is, has no bearing to reality. It's a fossil or an artifact, which has no meaning. But what you said, I think, should, deserves a certain further comment. First of all, the old code of canon law, canon 1013, explicitly said that the primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of offspring. Now, I, I know to a lot of people this might sound theoretical and somehow removed, but there is a very profound lesson. If that is not the case, and you do not follow the path set forth by God, you will have human misery. You will have divorce, you will have unhappy marriages, you will have, you will have uh, desolation. And by doing this, by this very subtle inference there, uh, I think the happiness and lives of millions of people are going to be affected, and for the worse. There's no question, Julius. Uh, I mean, the husband and the wife find their real happiness in their children and educating them and fulfilling the law of God. Uh, but where they become very egocentric. They will be filled with disgust. Right, and eventually they will learn to despise each other. And, you know... Because th they're just using each other. Th there's two other things. Well, go ahead, Father. Yeah, I just want to say that, I mean, when young people get married, good young people, you know, have the faith and everything. <clears throat> some of them get married explicitly because they have a desire to have a family, but some do it just because they fall in love and they want to live their lives together, and of course they want to have a family, which is, there's no problem. Uh, I think the problem that comes in is that people have to be protected. Uh, in other words, people who are of goodwill and want to do the right thing. <clears throat> they turn to the church and the, and the church says, well, here are the rules, here is the law of God, here's what you have to do. Uh, I, I don't think the point is that uh, uh, anyone is diminishing, let's say, the secondary purposes mm -hmm. of marriage, mm -hmm. which is the implication of, of the liberal theologians. In other words, their implication is by stating the primary purpose first and insisting on it, the secondary purpose second, that somehow you are diminishing that. And that's not the case at all, nor is the church insensitive to, to the needs uh, of people. It's just a question of what is the truth. You know what I mean? There is a truth, and the truth is that the primary purpose of marriage is the procreation and education of children. And then there are secondary purposes. And there is a subordination in that order according to God's mind. If, if you subordinate the primary purpose, you will destroy the secondary purpose. And that's what the liberals should bear in mind. You know, the secondary purpose of matrimony, which is the mutual comfort and happiness of the spouses, depends upon the first. Okay. By the way, the church always referred to them both as essential mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to marriage. And Father Jenkins, there's two more points that I think should be raised regarding the, the whole thing with, with marriage. Number one, uh, there is reference made to Holy Scripture and the Apostle St. Paul, husbands love your wives, all right? 
but I did not see a reference to wives obey your husbands. Now everyone knows that in any kind of society, if you remove order and authority, you're going to have chaos. So the first thing they did is they confounded the ends of marriage. The second per thing they did is they destroyed the authority in the household implicitly, or at least by suppressing explicit mention of it. And there's a third thing. Uh, we are now getting this concept of responsible parenthood. Uh, on, the, on the diocesan level, it's more striking than in the catechism, but already the seeds are there which say that, you know, you can limit your births lawfully, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you should, you know, take all these considerations in mind. And maybe you could tell us this. What was the teaching pre-Vatican II about lawfully limiting births? When could this be done, and when should it be done, and when could it not be done? Well, it could not be done artificially mm -hmm. by chemical means or, right. or physical means. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Church did approve at one time the, the rhythm method as a natural method mm -hmm. of avoiding conception, but it was limited to uh, circumstances that were very narrowly defined by the Church mm -hmm. because you know, a couple that did marry would have to marry with the intention of fulfilling God's law. You know, the very first command that God gave to our race was to bring into the world new human life. Increase, multiply, and fill the earth, he said to Adam and Eve. It's no wonder, since they've adulterated the nature of marriage, that they are annulling so many tens of thousands of them every That's year. That's right. You've been watching Latin.